Greetings all, and welcome back to the Riverdale vlog. This is for episode two, which you will be getting at roughly the same time that the vlog for episode one goes up, because I recorded episode one a couple of days ago, and there was a new episode last night. I'm recording this the Friday following episode two's airing on the CW, because I gotta do that, because I gotta watch it on my phone, on their app, which doesn't go up until the day after. Anyway, <laughs> so... Some interesting stuff happened in this episode. It's still early days yet, but we're starting to get some actual character development now that we've got the exposition out of the way. Um, I'm going to break this down character by character because there's a lot of stuff that happens, and um, we'll, uh, we'll go along as we have. We're going to start with Betty. Um, to recap... Uh, at the end of the last episode, Archie and Veronica kissed in the closet at Cheryl Blossom's party. Betty found out about it, got upset, and ran away. Uh, she later confronted Archie, and Archie said he didn't think he could be, give her the answer that she wanted about whether or not he loved her or not. And that's where we are now. Betty's kind of on the outs with Archie, on the outs with Veronica. Archie's on the outs with Jughead, and everything's just kind of... Yeah. Um, as also mentioned, uh, Archie and Ms. Grundy, during their tryst, were at the river uh, the morning of July 4th, where they heard what is apparently the gunshot that killed Jason Blossom. And that's what we need to know. That's all you need to know, at least for this particular episode, uh, except for one thing which I will get into a little bit later. Um, so starting off with Betty. Uh, Betty's mom is pretty much, you know, all but, all but gleeful that, you know, as far as she's concerned, uh, Cheryl and Veronica and Archie are all out of their lives and all that, all out of their lives and all that. It's not true because just, you know. But Betty tries to make everything all right again. You know, she makes up with Archie, she makes up with Veronica, and everything's hunky dory for a while until that lunchtime when Archie plays a new song that he's been writing and she has flashbacks to the dance and how she felt and she just kind of loses it and runs off and you know that's that's understandable i mean it's betty she tries you know and all that but you know archie and veronica feel terrible about it and believe it or not in defiance of all known convention of teen dramas rather than holding it in or being snarky or plotting revenge or what have you they actually talk to each other and try to work it out like, you know, reasonable human beings. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but this goes back to that whole thing that I've always mentioned. Anybody who wants to write off Riverdale as just yet another CW show is, on, is only looking at the surface. And they're not getting it that despite this darker tone, and despite this slightly edgier, edgier story, these are still inherently the characters from the comics. They're all generally good people. You know, um, Betty being, of course, the best of them. Anyway, um, so after her kind of falling out, she um, takes this gift certificate for a mani manicure and pedicure that Veronica gave her and out of, out of sheer spite um, invites Cheryl to go with her. So they do, and then they go back to Betty's house, and Cheryl's helping her with makeup and more or less trying to make her look exactly like her, and it just is not a good look for Betty, which I'm pretty sure was the intention. Um, but Cheryl's ulterior motives are ultimately revealed when she starts grilling Pe Betty about her sister Polly, who, as mentioned, is in a group home and isn't apparently psychologically sound, shall we say. Um, Cheryl more or less accuses Polly of having killed Jason, Betty gets angry and literally tells her, get out, get the hell out of my house or I will kill you. So Betty might be a little on edge herself, which is not really surprising considering her mother is fucking crazy. Seriously, her mother has like this bizarre obsession with proving the Blossom family is evil incarnate. Like, she makes jokes about them sacrificing Jason in some sort of bizarre, g dark ritual at their mansion. She's, like, burning sage to ward off evil spirits after Cheryl's been there. And all sorts of just strange, strange stuff, including some other strange stuff, which I'll get to in a minute. But just for the record, apparently in this universe, 
Betty's parents work for the local newspaper, when in the comics it's usually Reggie's dad. So that's the way it is here. Uh, speaking of other familiar familial changes, uh, Kevin's dad, Kevin Keller's dad, is apparently the sheriff. So yeah, rather than being, uh, rather than Kevin being an army brat, and his dad working at uh, Fort Pickens, which is outside Riverdale. Um, so just keep those in mind as we go along here. Um, but pretty much at one point, um, Veronica just basically comes right out and says, listen, I'm sorry, and you know, it's, I'm, it's not Archie, it's like, it, and she tries to point out that yes, Betty's hurt, yes, it hurts, but you know, it, it's, not, it's not Archie's fault he doesn't like you. Veronica's taking everything on herself because she considers that a backslide to who she was rather than who she's trying to be. And, you know, um, Archie and Veronica have a conversation about when he and Betty were kids, and they make a little Archie reference, so that's actually kind of cool. Uh, we see Betty's diary, which has always been a big thing in the comics, if you uh, if you follow the Archie comics at all. So, um, eventually they do work everything out. Um, Betty realizes that, yeah, she's kind of miserable without either without Archie or Veronica in her life. So they, so, you know, they, everybody talks to each other, everybody apologizes, and yeah, and it's, the, the friendship gets healed. Veronica doesn't have as huge a role. She's more of an ancillary element to Betty's storyline in this episode. I'm sure there'll be plenty of stuff with Veronica down the line. Um, and it, what really, it's so hard talking about this because everything kind of intertwines. It all, all these storylines actually do intertwine and they intertwine r really well. So excuse me if I kind of jump around a little bit and from story to story because it all, I'm trying to stay focused on the main beats for each character and I'll tie everything back near the end. Um, but yeah, eventually uh, Betty and Veronica decide, get, apologize, get, decide to be friends again they go have a milkshake at Pops, and um, pretty much they make a vow that no boy's ever gonna come between them as friends. And yeah, you know, that kind of line, I'm sure the shippers on Tumblr have gone bananas. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about your OTP. I don't care about that. And frankly, I don't care about any of the romantic relationships on this show. That's not what I'm here for. I am here for Archie and company being friends and solving a murder. That's what I'm here for. What you're here for, I, if you're here for shipping, more power to you. I don't want to hear about it. And I don't want to hear your cute pet names either. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Archie is, of course, still conflicted about what he heard and what he saw, what he heard uh, that morning at the river with Miss Grundy. And, you know, he's, and he has nobody to tell because he doesn't know what's going to happen if he does. He's been acting weird, and this comes to Jughead's attention, especially after we talked about what happened with Betty in the last episode. So, Jughead goes up to him and just, and we find out what it was that kind of caused the falling out between them. Um, apparently, Archie and Jughead were supposed to take a road trip over the 4th of July weekend, and Archie canceled, obviously, because of what happened with Miss Grundy and the gunshot following. So, he just, but he just kind of just sort of blew Jughead off completely after that. Word comes down from the sheriff over the PA system at Riverdale High. Yeah, I know. This is like, I don't think that, that uh, Jason's death is now being treated as a homicide now that his body's been found and there's a quite obvious gunshot wound in his head. And so, you know, they urge anybody with any information to come forward, which, you know, just plays hell with Archie for a while. And... Now, the one, that was kind of the one thing that made me go, I think that's bullshit. Because I really seriously doubt that they would announce over the PA at a high school that, some, that a student's death, even if his body was found, would suddenly be a murder. It might be a rumor, especially since Kevin and Moose were the ones that found the body, but they kind of, but you know, it wouldn't be confirmed. And I seriously doubt they would announce it like over the PA. That's just, okay, whatever. CW show, moving the plot along. Let's move on from there. Um, so naturally, rumors start flying from everybody as to who could have possibly killed Jason and all that. And in the... Um, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. So after that, Archie's passing by Mr. Weatherby's office. Oh, and Mr. Weatherby is black in this universe. And actually, the actor who plays him is really good. He seems to get the character really well. I mean, he's not in this a lot, but enough. 
the kind of educator who genuinely cares about his students and knows, you know, just the right distance to keep between stern disciplinarian and, you know, uh, approachable authority figure, you know, and this guy really gets it. I don't know his name and I don't have the ability to look it up right now, so I'm sorry. Um, but I really like him and I hope we see more of him because Mr. Weatherby has always been kind of important in the Riverdale High area and everything that's going on with that. So I, I hope to see more of Mr. Weatherby in the future. As Archie looks in, what Mr. Weatherby looks up and he sees Archie and you know, you just kind of get this impression that he knows something's bothering Archie and he approaches Archie later and doesn't outright accuse him of anything, but more or less makes it clear that he knows something's bothering Archie and it most likely has something to do with Jason's death. Um, after this, uh, Archie goes and talks to Ms. Grundy and pretty much he says he, he has to tell them because that's, that's what he wants to do. And Ms. Grundy's like, no, if you do it, we'll, everything will be ruined. I'll be fired. You'll be expelled. You'll po we'll possibly both go to jail. And, you know, all that. And Archie just, you know, asks her if what they have is real. And Ms. Grundy says that, it, she, that it's real. But you kind of get the feeling she's telling him what he wants to hear to get him to stay, keep his mouth shut. That she might actually be more concerned for herself than what's actually going on. She starts getting close to Archie and rubbing his hand and all that and everything. And that might have been the end of it except for one thing. Jughead happens to see him in the window of the door leading to the classroom where they're talking. And Jughead naturally goes at night over to Archie's and tells him what he saw, because that's Jughead. That's always been Jughead. Jughead pretty much lays it out for you. He's sardonic, but he's also very honest, and he doesn't stand for a lot of bullshit. He never has. He tells Archie that he saw what he saw, and Archie says he can't say anything about it. Tells him that he was at the river, and, and, and Jughead, you know, pretty much tells... Archie, it's like, listen, you know, you have to tell somebody a kid is dead. You know, you have to tell tell these people what you know. It's so they can figure out what happened. And Archie, like, you know, tells about what Miss Grundy said about his concerns for Miss Grundy, and Jughead's like, she's playing you. She's completely playing you. Like I suspect. He, he you know, Archie begs Jughead not to say anything. Actually goes so far as to leave it up a hanging thread. He says, if you tell anyone, and Jughead just looks at him like, what? What are you going to do? And he just calls Archie on this. Because he knows this is not Archie Andrews. As he puts it, he knows a guy. His name was Archie Andrews. And he was all, he never, he wasn't, he made mistakes, but he always tried to do the right thing. Jughead knows that this is killing Archie and he needs and, he sh and the only way it's going to be right is if Archie does come clean about what he knows. So, you know, Archie's conflicted about that. And then he has a conversation with his dad. And his dad pretty much tells him, you know, more or less the exact same thing. You should always do the right thing, no matter how much it hurts. And even if it's going to personally cost you, you should always try to do the right thing. At the pep rally for the uh, upcoming football game, uh, Archie talks to Ms. Grundy and tells her, hey, I'm telling the cops what I know but I'm going to try to leave you out of it if I can. And, you know, she tries to talk him out of it, but he's like, no, I can't do this. I've got to tell the truth. I've got to tell them what I know and what I heard. It's killing me. I can't. So he leaves her to mull over that. What she does, we'll probably find out in further episodes down the line. And then Archie goes to Jughead and tells him what he's going to do and asks if they're friends again. And Jughead gives a typical Jughead response. We'll discuss that later. Over many burgers and many days. Yes, a reference to Jughead and burgers. It has to be. It must be. <laughs> it must be. Now, if we can actually see Cole Sprouse eating a burger on camera, then I'll be happy. You know, a lot of Jughead fans will be happy. Talking about Cole Sprouse... Uh, for a minute, getting off the story stuff for just a minute. Like I said, last time in the last video, I couldn't really say much about Cole Sprouse's Jughead because of, um, because of, uh, how little he was actually in the first episode, like about three minutes total out of 47. So, but here we get to see more of Jughead, and yeah, he really does get the character. Um, Jughead is sardonic. Jughead is 
smart, uh, Jughead is actually smart, um, Jughead takes no shit. Jughead will call people on their bullshit when they're being self-delusional or just being dishonest. Jughead will call them on it. You know, there's a scene which bleeds toward the reconciliation between Archie and Jughead where Reggie's more or less accusing Jughead of killing Jason for being an emo weirdo because Reggie for some reason is an even bigger douche than he normally is in the comics. Um, it might be closer to, you know, um, the, you know, the new Riverdale Archie right here where Reggie is a little bit more of a bully and a little bit more of an asshole. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see where it goes from there because right now Reggie's kind of a tertiary character in all this. The focus seems to primarily be on Archie, Betty, Veronica, and Jughead, which arguably is where it should be. Um, hell, even the old Archie radio series from the 40s and 50s um, kept more or less everything to that dynamic and Archie's parents, but we'll get out of that another time. So anyway, Reggie starts accusing Jughead of doing it. Archie stands up for him. Things get heated. Archie and Reggie get into a fist fight. So, you know, Archie gets a black eye from Reggie and all that. So, you know, all that stuff. Um, so this brings us back. Anyway, getting back to um, Cole Sprouse and Jughead, he baits Reggie like he does, like Jughead has always done, is baiting Reggie. And yeah, Cole Sprouse, I think, really, really gets Jughead, and I like that. I think he's doing really well. The dialogue, a little stilted. Jughead has a lot more free-flowing, easy-going dialogue. That could be, once again, a matter of the tone the series is set up. But yeah, but by and large, I, I like Cole Sprouse as, uh, as Jughead. I, I really do. I, I think he, he has the character down, and um, I, I look forward to seeing what happens in the future. Then we uh, move on to um, Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, Cheryl is the queen bitch of Riverdale High. Cheryl may also be out of her goddamn mind. Like I said, she gets very, very intense when she's interrogating Betty about Polly. But later, but you see her in the biology class later, and um, Archie pairs off with her because for some reason he wanted to talk to her, you know, probably to find out something about it. And she plays like everything's fine, but she gets very, very tense when, you know, he, Archie offers to uh, do the frog dissection because it's always frog dissection for her because, as she puts it, oh, you mean because my brother's being dissected by the coroner right now? <laughs> and then she's just like, she takes takes the scalpel and she's like, I'm fine! <laughs> and just drags the damn thing down the frog. And it's just like, wow! Okay then! Yeah! And then it may even be more than that. Um, I've got a theory and it's kind of creepy and I'll get to that in a minute. So, later at the pep rally, Cheryl kind of has an emotional breakdown um, because when the football team comes on during the pep rally, Archie's in the lead. Now, back when he made the varsity team, the coach gave him a jersey and it was Jason's number. It was number nine. And that was Jason's number when Jason was alive and on the football team. Well, both Jason and Archie are redheads, so Cheryl sees Archie running wearing Jason's jersey and she kind of has a little bit of an emotional breakdown in the locker room, and Veronica and Betty go see what's happening. Veronica gets there first, and Cheryl lets something slip that's actually kind of interesting. She says he was supposed to come back. What that means, we don't know yet, but it's intriguing, along with some other information I'll give you in just a minute. But yeah, Cheryl... Yeah, things escalate even more when the following Monday, when Archie decides he's going to go in and tell Mr. Weatherby and the sheriff what he knows about the gunshot on July 4th, the sheriff and Mr. Weatherby come storming out of the office and go directly to the biology classroom where they arrest Cheryl. Because something in the autopsy that they found during the autopsy has pointed the direction at Cheryl, and she knows it. She stands up and says, it's because I'm guilty. And she gets arrested. But there's even more than that. We don't know everything that happened to the autopsy, but we do know a little bit before this point. Because Betty's mom 
drives the coroner to find out what the hell he's found so far. And in addition to the gunshot wound right between the eyes, Jason also has ligature marks on his limbs, which means he was tied up at some point. And the beginning stages of either hypothermia or frostbite. Which means he was also somewhere very cold, which could have been from the river, but who knows. So, Jason was somewhere tied up, starting to get frostbite, and as the narration in Jug that Jughead gives us at the end of the episode implies, Jason didn't die on July 4th. He died almost a week later, on the 10th or the 11th. So if that's the case, if Jason wasn't dead on July 4th, what the hell was the gunshot that Archie and Miss Grundy heard? What is with the ligature marks? What is with the frostbite? And what the hell did they find that implicated Cheryl? And why does Cheryl know that, they know that they're going to arrest her? It's very strange and very compelling. I don't have any theories. There's not enough evidence here for me to start theorizing about exactly what happened to Jason. But there is one thing which is kind of creepy that they seem to be implying, and it's not without precedent. When we, in episode one, when we first see the Blossom Twins going out to the river, they're dressed all in white, for starters, which is probably a little Twin Peaks influence going in there. But as they're walking toward the boat they're going to get in, they're holding hands. And not in a way that you would think brothers and sisters would hold hands. Later, at the beginning of this episode, we see some other flashbacks of Cheryl and, and Jason hanging out at Pops, and they're both drinking a milkshake with two straws out of the same glass. Again, not really what happens between brothers and sisters. It's very weird. And like I said, this kind of thing that they seem to be implying is not without precedent. But thankfully, not in either the original Archie universe, or the Married Life universe, or the New Riverdale universe. It is, however, right here in Afterlife with Archie. Which, coincidentally, yeah, right, was also written by showrunner Roberto Aguera Sarcasa. Um, Again, if I mangled your, his last name, I apologize. It's, I am not familiar with names of a Spanish der derivation. So yeah, in the pages of Afterlife with Archie, it's strongly implied that Jason and Cheryl have been in an incestuous relationship. And that seems to be what Riverdale's implying. I hope to God they're not because that's just a little too creepy for this. Just a little. That seems to be what they're implying. The tying up seems to imply some sort of bondage games, if that's the case. Again, I have no proof of any of this. This is me theorizing, and they're only tiny little theories that seem to be what's going on. I don't know for sure. For all I know, this will be disproved down the line, and I will be utterly relieved if it is. So yeah, that pretty much covers um, Riverdale Episode 2. Um, I'm still very intrigued because once again, aside from the elements needed to tell this particular kind of story, these are still very much the Archie characters that we know and love. And it's so fucking refreshing to actually see these people resolve their interpersonal conflicts by fucking talking to each other. You know, and actually resolving it without a lot of bullshit drama and letting the actual bullshit drama that is Jason's murder kind of take center stage for all the <gasps> moments. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, until next week, uh, when we visit Riverdale once again and see what other strange and bizarre things are going to happen. I'll see you next time with the next Riverdale vlog.